Well, at this point, I would like to introduce the moderator for the first panel discussion of the day, uh, Ms. Aggie Kondo, uh, who is the Vice President, Program in Innovation and uh, Delivery at the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. Aggie, a Ugandan national that describes herself as a pragmatic and result-oriented leader with over 15 years experience in senior leadership roles, across multiple private and public sector industries, tobacco, beverages, and multimedia, and most recently successfully transitioned to the economic development space, aquaculture, textile, and apparel, accomplishing remarkable growth and impact across five sectors. Under her leadership, a multidisciplinary team at Missingi East Africa scoped, designed, and implemented multiple interventions across two growth industries, aquaculture, textiles, and apparel, creating over 800 jobs and convening further interventions from multiple private and public sector actors. She's passionate around improvement of fish genetics to improve incomes of SMEs in the sector. Her passion for need to invest and grow local SMEs while working on the underlying enabling policy environment speaks to a lot of what AGRA does. I will now hand over to Aggie Kondo. Please put your hands together for her as she comes forward. There she is. You're welcome. Um, Thank you very much, and, and good morning, everybody. Good morning. We just had some perfect breakfast, so the energies should be much bigger than this. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Excellent. Thank you. I am honored to be here this morning, um, and uh, I have an excellent panel that I will be introducing to you shortly, uh, but allow me to start with the formalities. Um, Dr. Muhammad uh, Abubeka, Honorable Minister, Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, our host, um, Mrs. Ndindi Unele, who is also the board member of AGRA, but also a partner of Sahel Consulting, EU partners present in the room, all other supporters and partners here, our dear panelists that have taken time to speak to us today, this morning, and the teams and ladies and gentlemen behind the scenes that are putting this together. Ladies and gentlemen, you're welcome to our first panel of the day. I am indeed extremely honored and pleasure and delighted to be hosting this panel today, in which we are not just talking about the problem in our midst, but finding solutions that are ready to be scaled. I was extremely humbled today listening to Ndidi who said we need to put our egos aside. And I 100% agree to that prescription because without egos, we are indeed able to solve the world's largest problems. And as it said, it takes entrepreneurs to solve all the problems in our midst. So the panel that I'll be introducing shortly today is going to be showcasing the opportunities that are already proven, that are within our midst, that if supported, could be able to solve for the 19.5 million already hungry households and counting. That is really the problem that we have. So in no particular order, allow me to introduce the panel that is going to be uh, discussing this issue. Please welcome. Aminu Nyako, who is from Sebora International Farms. <laughs> Following Aminu is Anthony Job. Anthony Job, group taking co-head from Value Seeds. Welcome. Allow me to also introduce Nkiru Okapareke, CEO of Grow Farms, and she wears many hats. She will be speaking to us in multiple uh, hats. Also, allow me to introduce Win, um, 
Ayodeji, he needs no introduction, my good friend Ayodeji, but also a huge innovator in Nigeria and Africa. Welcome, CEO of Afex. Winfred, Winfred uh, Okafo, CEO Bonita Treats, solving for food waste. Exciting business initiative going up there. I hope I haven't forgotten one more. I think I have one more. Um, All right, so this is the panel that will be, okay. All right, great, thank you so much. I've got such an active audience, thank you very much. So as I take my seat, um, the topic for discussion today is how we would like to showcase, you know, how private sector led innovations, models and approaches are currently being applied to address the food crisis that we have in our Mideast. And to start this off, of course, you all know I'm from Agra. I'm the Vice President for uh, Program Innovation and Delivery. I would like to start from home because they say it all starts with good seed. Right? Doctor, you know where I'm going, right? So if it indeed it's, it starts with good seed, the stories we have heard, what we know is in our midst. I just learned today the 010. We cannot afford to be having our population having one male. Okay, I have one more panelist from Value Seeds. Please join me on stage. Saro Agro, please uh, welcome on stage. Okay. It's called a head up in golf, but you recover from it. Sorry about it. Okay, so yes, I wanted us to start uh, with Dr. Anthony. He is a plant breeder from Value Seeds. And he tells us that we've got all the climate smart, nutrient dense varieties already in Nigeria, but we are not getting these on time to the farmers. And we know we are solving for 30 million households that would like to access those within the next dry season. What is the challenge and what solutions are you putting on the table? How can you put your egos aside to scale that to all the households that we need to reach? Over to you, Anthony. Okay, um, good, mo good morning, everyone. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, yes, like it's mentioned, I'm a plant breeder and I work for Value Seeds. So it, it's a known fact that there are a lot of improved varieties now in the, in the industry. And um, there are quite a number of seed companies that are growing these varieties. However, um, adoption rate by farmers is still very low, you know, um, less than 5%. And that, of, of, of course, is a major, a major reason why um, crop outputs are below optimum. Um, scaling this out, of course, has to do with a lot of um, partnerships. You know, um, earlier in the day, in the dimension, the issue of extension officers not being, you know, enough and actually very low. Uh, these new technologies, people have to get to know them, have to get to appreciate them. Um, for instance, nutrient dense um, grains, you know, uh, pro vitamin A maize, for instance, quality protein maize. Um, th these products have an enormous, you know, impact in the industry. For instance, um, looking at the poultry industry, you know, um, lysine is an essential amino acid that is added to diets. And the industry spends a lot, you know, importing lysine from Brazil and different places like that. So if um, we could have like structured markets to produce quality protein maize, for instance, that would go a long way in reducing the cost of um, poultry, you know, production, meat and eggs. I remember it was mentioned today that an egg is about 18 naira now, which is far beyond the reach of the average Nigerian. So I think um, such things can really make much impact if uh, we get the kind of support that we need. Um, it's good that we have 
other players in the industry, like FX here, for instance, you know, um, if we have aggregated production and, you know, um, well-structured markets, for instance, this will go a long way in catalyzing adoption of these varieties and, of course, increase, um, you know, income for the farmers too, for instance. So at Value Seeds, we are doing um, quite a number of things. Uh, for instance, we are improving access to early generation seeds uh, with a sister company called Value Basic. We are also into a lot of research in um, climate smart crops. Like recently, we released um, low nitrogen and drought tolerant varieties, uh, which can produce quite well. You know, you could get up to four tons per hectare, even on single um, fertilizer application doses. So that, for instance, go, can go a long way, especially at a time like this, when fertilizer prices are, you know, way off, way up there. Um, also, we are into some pharma um, support programs. You know, we have some technology bundle packages. There's what we call the value kit maze, um, the rice kit, our kit. Um, the essence is to, you know, um, give farmers access to inputs, improved varieties, um, um, extension services, because we also backstop and work closely with these farmers to ensure that they make a success of what they are doing. And of course, um, give them access to premium markets, because we go the extra mile to make sure that the grains are of top quality. So thank you. Thank you very much, Anthony. So what I'm hearing from you is um, we already have the climate smart varieties. We've got nutrient dense, you know, we've got all the options, but adoption is just about 5%. And I'll be coming back to you on what can we do about it? Because this is not a talk shop is we want solutions. You're already reaching thousands of farmers. How can we scale that if we were to apply a 10x principle? But to probably build on to your point, let me invite Nkiru, who I know is equally in the same area. Nkiru, please introduce yourself quickly and just tell us, are you facing the same challenges and how can we be able to fast track access of these technologies to smallholder farmers? Good morning. My name is Nkiru Akpareke. Um, I weigh a couple of hearts. I'm a full-time farmer growing vegetables in Lagos and supplying supermarkets, but I'm also the board chair for IITA BIP. IITA BIP is a business incubation platform of IITA as a social enterprise of a profit company firm to take all the innovations from IITA and all the CGI companies and accelerate them to become fully commercial at a short time and make sure that all the public can have it. Um, so under that hat, we have a lot of units to have and we had some businesses that are already standing. We have the Nodomax, which is a legume inoculant, is a biofertilizer, and people use them when producing soybeans and beans. Um, we have the Aflasafe, uh, we have the license for Aflasafe, it's a chemical we produce, being put, but it's actually being manufactured by a third party, but we own the license, um, use it to inoculate against aflatoxins in maize and granules. We've had the issue of when we produce beans and granules and we export them. Protects you against that. Then we have the crop nuts agri-serve. It's a, it's a partnership we have with crop nuts. Crop nuts is the biggest soil technology company in Africa. Um, we use, they do soil survey, soil suitability, fertilizer testing, plant suitability. You, if you want to go into seed, the go seed is a unit that produces early generation seeds. Um, for commercial um, um, breeders. So we we'll produce um, plantain, uh, cassava, maize, um, beans, soybeans, and we use, in some of them, we use the SAH technology, which is the semi autotropic hydroponic te technology, which fastly multiplies breeder seeds for vegetative crops like yam and cassava if you have a project. And we also have the farm management section of that. What it means that if you want to go into crop production and you come to us in IITA BIP, would we'll handhold you from the beginning to the end. But the problem, just as Dr. Joe um, said, is there's a the low level of adaptability. And a lot of farmers, I'm a farmer myself, 
We want a bumper harvest. We're not ready to pay money in all the steps to get that bumper harvest at the end. Thank, thank you very much. So if, if we pick it up from there, and I know I, I'm going to be calling upon Aminu to just help us learn what that means, because you know we've got a crisis in our midst. We've got technologies that are ready, and access is a problem. From where you're sitting, and please with an introduction, what solutions have you tested and what options would you be suggesting to help us fast track that access? Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> my name is Aminu uh, Motala Nyako. I'm the MD of Seboe um, International Farms. We're into dairy processing. Um, our products are yogurt, butter, cheese, ice cream, and ghee. Over the last two years, we've integrated um, 12,000 um, dairy farmers into, our, um, into the dairy value chain. And we have been able to create um, multiple streams of employment, resources, and um, uh, opportunity to be able to grow. Um, we're in partnership with um, Sahel Consulting and the Central Bank. And we also have partnerships with the Federal Ministry of Agriculture to be able to scale this. Um, for us, it's interesting to know that our strategy has been a bit more pragmatic in terms of challenges that farmers face. Um, the reason being is uh, we, we currently sit on a milk base in um, northern Nigeria, and we import a lot of our milk products. Um, Ms. Indidi mentioned the two cheapest proteins are actually eggs and milk. And these two things are um, uh, in very short supply currently. We have the cows, but we, we're importing milk products. So one of our strategies is to integrate at the very community level, farmers um, um, innate capacity to provide milk. This requires a lot of investment in terms of extension, in terms of education, and most often than not is the access to the market. We are now aggregating at a very high scale milk from communities and has given them an understanding of what value the milk provides. For us, we, we, we decided not to focus mainly on the productivity part first, because a lot of them, even after um, cultivating land, have a lot of post-harvest losses, which serves as a, a, um, a direct um, delimiter of how much they produce next year. So for us, what we said is, if you have one liter of milk, we will buy one liter of milk. And that has given the farmers confidence to then invest in their cows, in the nutrition, in water systems, in food systems, because they know that there is a ready offtake to be able to offtake this market. So as we move forward now, we're looking at ways to teach farmers how to then increase their yield. But we've made them, we've given them some assurance that whatever you produce, you can, you, 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 you can, va you can find value for it. For us, that is extremely important because our population, our land is our comparative advantage. And we are not currently even utilizing or fully taking advantage of what is already available. And we're looking at improvements. So for us, um, we, we could talk more about it. But for us, it's basically looking at the resources that are available currently and doing the things that are absolutely necessary to provide value to what we have. And then we can scale um, accordingly. Thank you. Very much. I think that's a live example on how we can take out an existing crisis and guaranteed income, but improved livelihoods as well. I like that you're meeting the farmers where they are, then giving them the incentive to do more by then teaching that. So I think that's something that other sectors could also learn from, and it will be interesting to see how can that be applied across, you know, any other of the staples that we are looking at as well. So let me bring in Winfred as well uh, from Bonita Treats to give us another relevant example around how you can manage post-harvest losses. Welcome, Winfred. Please introduce yourself and share your example. Thank you. My name is Winifred Okafor. I'm the CEO, founder and CEO of Bonita Foods, a dried fruit um, nut manufacturing company here in Abuja. Uh, we started, we've been in business since 2017. In actual fact, it started as a hobby, just processing uh, food that, products that I liked, coconuts turned into coconut chips, dried pineapples turned into a pineapple snacks and dried bananas. 
your point about post-harvest losses, sometime in 2018, we started to um, so when people think about the dried fruit um, market, you're constantly thinking about the plain vanilla, dried pineapple, dried banana, and oftentimes these products have to be created from perfect pineapples. You know, the pineapples can't be overripe, otherwise they wouldn't dry properly. The bananas have to be cr still crispy at the time at the point of processing. But we started to innovate using. Um, products and um, inputs that were almost lost. So for example, overripe bananas that uh, women would have struggled to sell, overripe pineapples that are at risk of loss. And we started to convert that into um, a blend of snacks. So now we have clusters from pineapple that utilizes uh, coconut waste and, uh, um, and or, or almost at loss um, pineapples. We have biscuits from bananas that utilize uh, some banana flour, but a lot of, a huge chunk of that, uh, the raw material in that is almost lost bananas. So we're doing a lot of upcycling in the um in the in the factory and these products have actually become our fastest sellers so it, although we started with uh, just the vanilla type uh, dry coconuts this blend of uh, upcycled bananas and pineapples have become the fastest sellers the best sellers of our factory right now and we are scaling our ability to process to absorb more of these um almost lost uh, products and uh, and and produced um, more of those products, churn out more of those products into the market. So that's what we're doing with uh, post-harvest losses. We're also working with factories, uh, cashew factories, for example, that have less than um, perfect nuts, cashew nuts that uh, for exports. And we are processing that into clusters and uh, snacks that you're seeing in the market. And these are fast selling. And so we're off taking a lot of uh, byproducts from factories, minimizing food, late, um, food waste, what's um, minimizing the food waste and also increasing the um, lively, improving the livelihoods of these small scale farmers that would have had to face these the economic impact of these losses uh, so th th that's translating to um, improved livelihoods for them no, th thank you very much Winfred for sharing that 40 percent of farmers produce gets wasted 40 percent and really we're saying if we sold for just food waste alone even at 90% of that, we would recover another 30% of available food. What a fantastic innovation to share. So before I bring in the money boy, let me first introduce again Rashid Sarunim to help us tell us, how do we solve for this crisis? From where you're sitting, what is the one practical idea you think we should spend a bit of time focusing on to solve for the crisis that is imminent? Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kola Didada. I'm actually representing uh, Rashid Sarumi, uh, who is unavoidably uh, half center. All right, in Saro, Africa, uh, made up of several subsidiaries, uh, but a critical uh, part of our business is the Saro Agrosciences, where we are into agri input distribution and also providing solutions to the farmers. And uh, we've had several milestones, like uh, taking the farmers to school to be able to get them to use the product in the right way. And also, we were also able to democratize distribution because uh, relying solely on, the, on government sales, we know the implication of the predictability is not there. So we're able to democratize distribution. And uh, in Nigeria today, we have one of the widest uh, distribution within the rural network of Nigeria. Okay, and also within Saro, we also have a JV with uh, Sitco International, where we have uh, the Sitco Nigeria. I currently manage that uh, uh, part of the business. And uh, from where I stand, because I live and work from uh, Kaduna and uh, intimately work with the farmers, and I'm able to see that uh, there are a lot of challenges, but we believe that through collaboration, we should be able to solve some of these challenges. And I think, uh, through this discourse we've heard, uh, we need to put our ego aside to be able to work together. But for me, critically for collaboration to work, we must be able to identify all the challenges. Because uh, the food challenges we are facing today, they are symptomatic of the challenges that uh, do exist. And the fundamental one for me, where I stand, is insecurity. And uh, in addressing insecurity, it has to be a holistic approach. Uh, there has to be the stakeholder, a stakeholder management approach, very critical. And uh, because I've seen what the impact of insecurity has done this year, really. Uh, we may say there's an imminent food security. It is true. It's coming. Very clear. Because we've seen acreage under cultivation reducing, one. We've also seen uh, inability to even attract the right 
talent you know to be able to work within the rural space is also a big challenge so i believe strongly we're able to first and foremost manage insecurity the challenges associated with it through a stakeholder management approach then we can also now start talking about the other building blocks thank you Thank you very much, uh, Kalode, for bringing that up because we were reminded earlier today that none of us is safe until everyone is safe. And therefore, because it's happening elsewhere, we don't think it will happen to us. It is happening to all of us today. And, and the opportunity that we have is to make agriculture not just inclusive, but to look at farming as an enterprise, as a business innovations that you all have brought to the fore and this is really a tip of the iceberg the point is that there's so many innovations out there what i also hear is that there's not enough financing coming into the hidden middle and allow me to introduce iodeji uh, ceo affix to help us break down this complexity is it indeed true that these innovations cannot be financed what is it we can do to get the big boys, the banks, the private capital to actually finance these innovations? Because it's from these solutions we have had that we can solve these problems. Over to you, Deji. Thank you, my sister. Um, so we, it, it, the, the short answer, yes, innovation can be financed. And uh, we've seen quite a number of examples, uh, which I'll come back to. Uh, but the first question, we have to first look at the point Culture, um, you know, when I when I think of innovation and when I think of you know the food systems, pretty much, and to uh, parallel it with any other, um, you know, and bring it to market. Um, you know, imagine a big pharmaceutical company, which is one of the biggest spenders in R&D globally. Um, they will never start an ideation and innovation process without finding a problem in the market they're solving for and estimating the market size and understanding the willingness to pay for that. And we will pay. Uh, sometimes it is the use of the drugs that will pay. Sometimes it's government. Sometimes it's the developing community. But all those are clearly mapped out before the innovation starts from. Despite the fact that they have 10% of their profits almost year on year devoted to innovation. Now, when we think about it, about our innovation system in agriculture, um, the only time I get talk spoken with by, you know, the players in the, in, in the seeds or on the input space is either when it's, you know, four weeks before the rain starts or when they are doing a conference to launch new seeds. And then you come into the all four hours of very technical conversations around, you know, all the kind of nutrients, fortification. And I'm like, what problem are we solving for? Who are we solving for? Who is going to pay for what we are creating? Right? And until we get to that question of how do we innovate, you know, you know, talk, engaging the market, understanding the demand, and solving a problem, we'll never have product market fit. So what we have, particularly in, the, in, in Nigeria, and allow me to isolate in the seed systems, is that we have multiple innovations, but there's zero product market fit. You know, Faro 44 is the you know, it's 80% of market share of rice being sold, you know. Um, it's, and then we have over 200 varieties that have been released and approved. I don't know, maybe the number is wrong, but many, many of those, of those varieties out there. So the question is, how do we understand who the buyer is and how do we innovate for that? The second is that, um, you know, you know we, 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 now, we now operate in Kenya and in Uganda more recently. And... In, in, in Kenya, we disbursed loans to 10,000 farmers. It was our fourth season. 100% um, got seeds with their input bundle. In fact, there was a prerequisite. You cannot disburse a bundle if you didn't have seed in it. In Nigeria, 10 years we've been at it, we managed to cross 15% of acceptance of seeds. The farmer would just not take it. It's almost like you're forcing them to get it. And at 15%, we're three times the national average in terms of adoption of hybrid seeds. And the problem is the trust. They just don't trust it. And remember, trust is a function of statistics. If I use this since five times, it works five out of five or four out of five. 
If I use it and it works only two out of five, there's a 40% success rate. So probably speaking, I am, it's a higher chance of me using my safe seats than to bet on this, which also increases my cost of... The farmers are rational economic thinkers, and that's how they think. So first is, how do we innovate? Are we creating a product that... Are we innovating around things that have product market fits? Second is, what is the fidelity of what we're creating? You know, the final product that gets to the table, to the market, what is the quality assurance? How much of investment are we making? Um, you know, are we, as investors in the business itself, investing our capital? Or are we just getting donor grants to provide the seeds and get it to market? And hence, we need to churn out multiple varieties. So I think that's the first problem that we have to get to. Looking at it and saying, moving up the line, how can we then start to come from a solutions mindset? So we have to, you know, I think funding is available. And, you know, we just need to say, how can we attract the right funding for agriculture? There's been several experiments that have been successful. I keep saying one of the, even though problems, um, you know, uh, uh, one of the successes we had in the last decade has been the agri-tech rise. There are certain things that need to be fixed. It's not a perfect model, but we've seen that if you have a strong value proposition and you bring it to the market, people are ready to take a risk on agriculture and unlock capital. Now, there is a big mismatch in terms of short-term funding for long-term asset creation. There is lack of regulation in terms of managing that space and transparency as well. Um, so we've had issues in the space, but that's some of the innovations. Innovations, you never get it right once. It is multiple iterations. How can we then iterate on that? Um, if you look at markets that have been evolved, the last market that has sort of grown to scale and productivity is sort of like um, Eastern Europe, right? You know, it's been 20 years of continuous growth, you know, in, in food production. And then you say, what has changed, right? So and it's at that core of how can you separate the owner of the land, right, which is the asset, the farmer, who is a trained technical expert to farm, and then the provider of capital, right? Because you need these three things in one. One in 10 chances do you find the three things in one enterprise. Most of the time, the capital owner is separate from the land owner and is separate from the technical farmer. Now, when the guy that has a thousand hectare is retired 35%, 30 years after service, and he says, I want to go to farm, <coughs> you know, everything goes down. And then it's like, agriculture is a bad business. But you're not a trained farmer. You wouldn't go and set up a school you know, without training or bringing the skills or set up an hospital. So until we're able to create a system that brings the three things together in Africa, we will still struggle to fund our food systems. Thank you very much, DG. And I think I, li I like the challenge you've thrown back to the scientists. And they say this a lot um, in, in our own meetings. They say, I would like to have a farmer in the midst of these conversations. Who are the farmers in the room? Show of hands, who are the farmers? Excellent. So we've got quite a lot of farmers and it would be good to see and you know, we'll give an opportunity for farmers to really share their own experience so that we can know that we are really resonating with a problem. So Deji throws a big question and I would like to come back to uh, Dr. Anthony. Are we starting with a problem in mind? What are we solving for? When I look at the varieties that are available, the farmer adoption is eight, nine-year-old varieties. That's the average across sub-Saharan Africa. And right now we have smart plant breeders still breeding. Where do we connect the needs of the farmer? Now, right now we have a new challenge. They don't have access to fertilizer, right? So they are applying local nuanced solutions with different hybrids. How are you bringing the farmer into the conversations for R&D? Hey, thank you very much for your question. Um, did, did, you made a, did you made a point, you know. Um, the, the farmers maybe don't trust, you know. And um, one thing you have to understand is this is their livelihood. You know, they have nothing else to do apart from this. Uh, many of us, even the, a lot of the farmers in the room right now, I'm sure maybe farming is a part-time for them, or, or maybe they combine it with one or two things. But these guys, you know, this, this is... They don't want to gamble because they also feel there is no... Like, say, like the risking factor, like, okay, if I 
go with this seed and this happens you know I'm, I'm messed up for the next one year so um i think what we need to do of course and this is also for all my colleagues not only um the seed company i'm working with i think um they say seeing is believing you know so we need to do more you know things convinced to adopt these technologies um technology adoption is slow you know that's why you find out that a lot of people are still using old varieties um I, I, I hear of people asking for even 1980-something varieties that were bred in, in the early 80s, for instance, you know. So, um, but again, so many times it's also the wrong notion. The average farmer thinks um, growing hybrids is super expensive because they believe that, you know, hybrids require a lot of fertilizer, a lot of management. They feel they are not as tough as their own land races or their local varieties. But of course, these perceptions have changed. You know, in recent times, plant breeders are breeding for very tough varieties. You know, um, low nitrogen tolerant varieties, drought tolerant varieties, disease resistant varieties. So right now, they need to, you know, kind of switch from what they're uh, used to, to these new things. But In terms of do the farmers participate in um, breeding or in designing breeding, um, you know, um, product profiles? Yes. Well, in in, in the past, I, would, I wouldn't say so. <laughs> you know, it is, it's more of the researchers sitting down and sometimes thinking, you know, what is best for the farmer products. And at the end of the day, the farmer brings up one excuse, like he tells you, "Oh, this your variety is high yielding, but it's not tasty." You know, I prefer my local one, which I make better tool with, for instance, and and that can be really interesting and discouraging. Um, nowadays, yes, we try to um, add value seeds. I, I interact a lot with the farmers, with the outgrowers, you know, even with the village, even some of the casual workers to try to you know, get their piece their fields and say, "Oh, we like your fields," but they think, you know, replicate or duplicate because they think there's something special we are doing that but they don't have access to so um those are some of the things we're trying to do to get them more involved in varietal development because that's the only way that these varieties will be able to scale if not it will just be talk and you know news and not getting there you know. you do a catalyze a great conversation so we will start with a problem in mind and the problem in mind is really what is the farmer trying to solve for, looking at farming as an enterprise. Let me come back to you, Nkiru, again, because I know that uh, you have mentioned before that farming itself is a very fragmented community and that we need to find ways of aggregating that demand in a manner. And, and I think you also alluded to that. In your experience, what has worked? How best can we aggregate this demand? And, you know, what can be the solution that you can propose that can be taken to scale? Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I answer that, I also want to comment on something they just said. Okay. Um, I'm a farmer, so I can indict my fellow farmers. The scientists can indict us because they don't know what we we'll go through. Um, he was talking about trust in the seeds. Why I'm indicting my fellow farmers is this. You buy a seed. Every seed has a protocol. Some of us farmers don't follow the protocol. Then we blame the seed seller. And then we'll pass on that information that the seed is bad. You buy a seed, there has, a, has to be a spacing. There has to be when you use pesticides, herbicides, when you apply your fertilizer, when you should even harvest it. A seed might tell you you should harvest 70 days and you leave it at 75 or 76 and you come out and say the corn is dry, it's not so sweet, but you did not follow the protocol. So that's also now breeds trust because we pass it on to ourselves. So that is why I'm indicting farmers. And then it means that next time most people won't buy it. Um, there's, as I, you, were, you asked me, asked me that there's fragmentation of farmers. What I have found out what will work, which isn't working, is what Ndidi also alluded to when she made her presentation. One to 7,500 extension service workers. One, I've been in farming for nearly 10 years. I've never met an extension 
service worker. Not from the federal government, not from the state, not from anybody. And those people are the knowledge base. Those are the people who can, because they are maybe, a former extension worker that's an expert in YAM is going to visit a lot of communities. That's the person that's going to pass on the information about the right seat and the right thing. Another way to get farmers together is through cooperatives. But we found out that the cooperative system in Nigeria is not really truthful. People register cooperatives, and when you tell them to come for um, cooperatives to get loans, and then when you tell them, let me see the number of people in your cooperative, that is when you find out it's the mother, the father, the sister, the brother. So we have found out that that really doesn't work. At the end of the day, trying to get farmers into a group is a job that the government needs to play a big part, and also some governmental organizations are the ones who can help us to get farmers into groups, into structures for us to be able to sell them or show them the things that can improve their livelihood. Well, um, you, you do throw another point there, which I'm, I'm, I'm keenly looking at the opportunity. You know, we do all agree that extension is broken. And I'm reminded by one of my board members that says that one of the inputs that we forgot to address in solving for inclusive agriculture transformation is information as an input to farmers. So if you have been in farming for 10 years and you haven't met an extension officer and it's you, right? And I'm in Lagos, which you say is cosmopolitan, I'm not in the village. Then Great. how can the farmer in the village in Jagawa have met an agri extension worker? Great. So I'm looking at that, that number, one to 7,500. Isn't that a job opportunity for our young people? How do we yes. bring young people to serving this need? This is a job opportunity. And I think, Deji, I'll come back to you because we have been on multiple platforms discussing <laughs> why are we having our smart young people flocking out of our borders to go and look for alternative employment when we can give them a dignified job right here at home. And in extension, there it is. Just reducing that ratio from one, in Agra we have defined an optimum number, one to 200. That alone, even then it's huge, but in marketing we say every one person has opportunity to reach 200 people in your inner circle directly. How can we create meaningful jobs in agriculture? And let me come back to you, uh, Deji that can cre enable young people to look at farming as an entrepreneur opportunity or employment opportunity. Thank you, thank you. Every time I asked um, the question about youth in agriculture, um, the first question I asked myself is, if my son says he wants to be a farmer, um, I'm going to have an heart attack. <laughs> That's particularly the way we define farming today. Um, and it is, you know, we players in the space today, we have that, um, you know, we have that obligation to create a model um, that makes this meaningful for them, that we're not creating more poor people um, by creating more farming jobs uh, or, or more agri-business agri related jobs, enterprises. Um, you know, if you, can't, if you can't create a model, and we don't have the answer at Apex, but at least we are trying to solve for it. Um, if you cannot create a model that makes the farmer, a young graduate, earn $20,000, $5-10 million naira in two to three years of being in that business, we are filled. We will, they would rather leave and go and wash toilets um, in other countries um, than stay here and be farmers. Let's be frank. We wouldn't have youth in agriculture if we do not create an economic model that makes them earn a living wage uh, or, or a decent wage. Um, at least we won't have the kind of talents that we need to grow the productivity to where we need to be. Um, now, how do we do this and what's the point of extension? So one of the ways that we, we need to think is that, um, you know, coming out of AGRA last, uh, AGRF last week, and uh, Agi, thank you for convening 2,600 people, um, you know, across, across, across Africa. <laughs> um, um, in Kigali for a fantastic, you know, four or five days of thinking what are the root problems around agriculture and finding solutions? Um, but one of the key things somebody said, you know, that I, one of my big five takeaways from Agra was that we need to have every a dashboard every year 
count the number of $1 billion agribusinesses we have in Africa, count the number that has increased, and that is one metric that we all rally ourselves about. Because, you know, when, 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 when the tide moves, it carries everything along. When you have big businesses, it creates opportunities down the chain. It carries everybody, in close, particularly if it's in agriculture, right? You can then start to say, how then can you, because if you think about extension, and then tech enabled extension is what comes to mind for a small guy to then go and say, I have 200, 500 people in my community, I want to sell services to them. But then you have to bring in the knowledge into his phone, right? And then you have to engage him on the rules of engagement, right? And then you have to then tie that knowledge into a service. Because selling education, which is what extension is, without an income in mind, there's not going to be any way that will buy it. If the guy comes and says, you know, pay me 10,000 naira for a year of training, but the farmer says, where am I going to end that 10,000 naira times three? Are you bringing a loan with the training you're giving me? Are you giving me market access? Am I going to multiply my yields by extension alone if you don't give me the capacity to use the inputs I need? I'm not just going to get the magic outputs. So we have to look at this as a bundle service, but we also have to look at it and say, how can we create an ecosystem that then enables those services? So maybe a tech company that comes in, digitizes content, creates a mobile solution, employ a thousand young graduates or guys with diplomas, do the training from them, and then pushes them out for specific value chains linked into markets or an ecosystem, then you start to see this, then it becomes a viable model. Because the guy gets 10,000 farmers from 200, 10,000 naira each from 200,000 farmers and starts to build an income but also can earn a little bit commission on fertilizer, a little bit commission on grain sales, and a few of those kind of things. Today, FX has a thousand uh, field extension officers. Um, thanks to Agra again for being able to fund the, optimizing that model to a way where we can then tie the field extension officers to the income stream and then earn it back. So each of our 1,000 guys get 40,000 Naira every month. And then they have a 180,000 naira bonus that is paid across three different, every quarter there's a target, there's a KPI, it's either data quality, loan repayment cycles, uh, productivity of the farmer, and then they get a commission above it. And that's one, right? So people can come in and join, but that's not even enough in any manner and form. We need a thousand of those to really solve this gap. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I do like... Oh. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Deji, for that. I think so we're seeing models that are already being tried and tested around how to make, you know, the youth find these jobs meaningful and dignified. And uh, let me uh, equally get additional insights from uh, Bonita Treats because you are already providing employment, right? So tell us about the role of extension in helping you get quality inputs into your factory and where you would see young people finding, you know, attractive jobs in that process. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, to, to land on top of what Deji is saying, I definitely see an opportunity for that information to cascade down to the farmers. It will translate to the um, better quality yields better quality outputs that we can also uh, um, process, we can also convert into shelf-stable products. Mm -hmm. That's really where, we're, where we play. We are, we are processors first. Mm -hmm. We're providing jobs in factory jobs at first. But um, as we go along, as we get bigger, we're now starting to see the, um, we're now starting to explore backward integrating in some of, the, some of the products that we use. For example, sesame seeds. We're working with a small farm, small farmers around our factory to offtake a portion of their, a portion of their products. And that's, um, this year we're going into training, training them and um, helping them to improve uh, their outputs from that perspective. The more, the more, the more, the more they can improve their yields, the more they can, they can find factories like ours that can offtake even about to, um, about almost lost products, the better their outcomes, the better their outputs um, um, for, for them, really. Okay, so uh, in particular, how many jobs do you think you can create if there was no limitation on scaling your business 
let's just yes well, you know well, some at numbers the moment, there our factory has uh, 65 um, workers um, 80 percent of them are um, of those are women in the next year we, ex we expect to ramp that up to almost 200 just increasing our capacity wow and that's just from the factory as we begin to work um with the farmers there's of course uh, more um, opportunities to um employ more people really okay. we have pe we, ha we actually have casual workers that have not included in this number that when they're not working in a factory they're working on farms so sometimes we have to poach them off the farms that they're working on for the day or for the for you know they help in pre-processing um in the factory so there's this other number of people that as we scale we begin to take take them take them off um off the um, unemployment really <laughs> thank you very much uh, so you know, I want to throw a challenge at you, and I'll be coming back to that. Is um, have you thought of franchising your model, mm -hmm. whereby we can get to solve for post-harvest losses across all the states in Nigeria that grow, you know, uh, pineapple and banana and all that? I think that's a challenge I will want to throw to most entrepreneurs because we like to hold our thing. As, as opposed to thinking about the bigger problem we can solve for. But I'll, I'll come back to that, just to think about it. Great, so uh, let me come back you know, to, again, uh, you know, solution providers. I mean, you are already creating massive jobs. Tell us about how many jobs you're creating with your solution. And if I asked you to 10x that, what would it mean for you? Well, thank you. Um like I, like I initially, <clears throat> um, I'll piggyback and I'll respond to your um, question directly. I think um, Seboe Farms is really and truly maybe at the epicenter of what other parts of Nigeria are actually facing. Um, we're, we're located in the Northeast, so finance finds itself very difficult to locate itself in the Northeast because of all the different rubrics that are uh, given or risk factors that are taken into consideration. Um, Dairy farmers typically use improved seeds for their cattle. So we're also at the confluence of that. Milk in itself is extremely perishable. So post milking losses, I'll put it in quote, the farmer has to cool, the, cool its milk to four degrees within the space of two hours. So in terms of post harvest or post milking losses, I think I'm at the very end of the spectrum. But what we've decided, and I'm a young person, and I'm in agriculture, so everything that has actually been discussed across here <laughs> lands up at the very <laughs> feet of my table. But what I want us to realize is the opportunity in agriculture has to be first seen from the bottom up. I think a lot of the solutioning that we look at, we're looking at a very niche set of people that are looking at these solutions and um, trying to understand the risk and reward that, that will come from it, from tech, for example, in, improved seeds. A lot of farmers, if they have losses in a farming season, that affects their entire year. It, it affects their ability to access healthcare, um, feed their families, pay for education. So what you see as a, a trivial extension worker um, gap is a much more weighted decision for an individual farmer. So what we've done in terms of how we have solved for most of these issues within the Northeast, which people think are, uh, is an unsafe region, we, the Northeast probably has about 35 million people. And if you're not careful, that insecurity, be it physical security, food security, or healthcare security, will be exported to other parts of the country and then they will start weighing down. What we've done is we've had a blend of innovation that makes it extremely attractive for young people in the language you understand to make them understand that there is a viable um, way of earning a decent living by coming into the dairy value chain. That for me, the story sells more than the solutioning that comes about from it. Within our, within our um, ecosystem, we've invested in renewable energy. The entire Northeast of Nigeria gets 50 megawatts of power. My dairy plant takes 1.5 megawatts. Adama State gets seven megawatts of power. One factory is taking almost 40% of that. It tells you that all, if, you, if you rely on the typical grid structures to be able to deliver power, which is essential for agricultural processing, you already be at the back end. So we invested in renewable energy. Nigerian cattle system, uh, African cattle systems are diversified. Western society, you find one farm that has 60,000 cows. 
Nigeria has those numbers, but they are diversified across a lot of households. I have 70, 50, 30. The only way you can bridge that kind of gap is to infuse technology. So we invested in a farm management system that has GPS locations of the entire 12,000 farmers. We know the amount of cattle they have. We know if they are nomadic or sedentary. If they don't have um, access to finance or financial institutions, we've introduced mobile wallets to be able to pay farmers every single Saturday. And in, in, in terms of making this attractive for youth, we, I plainly say it, the, 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 the lowest earner of farmers within this 12,000 and 60,000 naira a, a, a month. And on average, a farmer in the Northeast right now within the, the program, the Aldin program, earns 120,000. That's four times minimum wage. So for us, we've seen that youth, Nigerian youth and youth in general, Gen, uh, Gen Z, they like Jaye life. So the honest truth is, if you don't show them that they can actually earn a decent living to be able to look up to their aspiration, then every other thing you're trying to package for them will not, will, 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 is not going to work. So what we've done right now in partnership with the central bank and other government agencies is we have built collection centers and we have actually gotten trained extension agents from those communities. So there are people that are familiar with the terrain. There are people that are familiar with households that already have the resources of cattle to be able to come into the program. And we just do the train the trainer, but we don't bring them from uh, 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 Lagos or Sokoto to come and train somebody that is in Jada, in Adamawa. You do not know the environment. Nigeria is extremely di uh, diverse in terms of its people, in terms of how they understand things. So localizing it first, I think Nigeria sits on a natural resource base that is unseen everywhere. And once you come from outside the country, you see it, but the people don't seem to understand it. For us right now is to educate our people and let them know there is opportunity in agriculture. And because we pay every single Saturday, our farmers have become the most credit worthy farmers possibly in Nigeria. They give them improved seeds on credit. They, teach, they give them fertilizers on credit because they do know that you already have a base that gives, provides you income and that allows you to then take the risk required to increase productivity. So when a farmer tells you he probably had a, 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 a good harvest in 1973. So if he wants to farm this year, he's going to reference back to something that is emotional for him and was successful for him in the past. You breaking that link requires you to go the extra step. I personally look to young Nigerians, especially in the Northeast, the average age of people within our company is 27 years old. So they are the ones handling my renewable energy, they handle collection, milk logistics, processing, sales. Across the board, we have created opportunity and it's young Nigerians that are leading the drive. So as of date right now, I think we've created about 390, uh, 390 millionaires within our dairy value chain. This tells you that they know that they have value within milk. They know that if they follow the instructions or protocol as used in seed, to be able to deliver quality milk to these collection centers, they will be rewarded um, uh, in tandem. That builds the trust that we're saying that needs to be established. That's why previously in my comments, I mentioned that I, we, don't, we don't start with the glitz and glam. What do you have available to you? These, this collection system has already started being sampled within shea butter, within maize, within soya bean, within baobab. And all of them, these are crops that Nigerians already, by default, based on your geographical location, are already engaged in. How do you create value with what they already see? Once you do that, every other kind of value-added processing becomes natural to them. They would invest. We have farmers that are paying extension agents to teach them how to plant feed for cattle, for milking processes. So external funding that would just come to do that is no longer necessary because the farmers now have the agency, the ability and the choice to be able to increase their productivity by themselves because they know they have a backdrop of risk to be able to take up. I've spoken too much. Thank you. No, um, I would like you to make your concluding remarks then I'll, I'll, I'll come back to Dada. My question was, you have created 390 million millionaires already. Already. How do you make that 39,000 millionaires? 
so <laughs> I think it, it, for me, it's a gradual process. We think we might get to a thousand before the end of Q4 next year. Um, the reason being is that we've, we've just commissioned, um, two months ago, the largest dairy factory in Nigeria. Um, it's powered by renewable and it's going to allow us to go to every single ward or poly unit within the Northeast and collect milk. And once we're doing that, we do understand that these rural farmers don't have a high expense ratio. They don't pay rent, they don't pay tax, their, their, their meal structures are very simple. So we are seeing high levels of savings within this farmer's intranet. For us is to cascade that scale by building more um, uh, collection centers, more trucking, milk trucking, to come to the factory. We, our model is a model of shared prosperity. I think not every farmer needs to have a yogurt processing plant. We have done a, a model whereby we have taken the brunt of processing and we have de-risked the farmer's um, ability to get to market by saying milk and we'll buy. Thank you, Thank you very much. And uh, I'll throw this back to Colado. We each have one minute to wrap up. You've just had the market here. And I'm sure from, if you wear your seed hat on, you can be an input for the dairy sector in terms of feed, correct? What is your one minute pitch on what you can do in your current company to solve for the food crisis? One minute, Kolade. All right, thank you. Uh, I think for us, one critical thing is uh, understanding the farmer's journey, okay, and know where to actually meet them. So critically would be about uh, understanding that journey and also have the right product that delivers on their on their need. So if you look at the uh, for the dairy for the dairy uh, market, for example, we have products that are well adapted to that particular theory. So we believe that through collaboration, I will emphasize that again, we should be able to raise. Okay. Them. So I hope you will be having conversations after this. Deji, one minute. What is the solution? And I will hold you accountable to this 12 months down the road. So please be audacious in your statement as well. Over to you. Market is the best fertilizer. That's a saying in Brazil. Don't give me fertilizer, give me markets. Every other thing follows. I think one of the things we are innovating around is we currently have 50 agri SME, agri tech companies that we have franchised our model to. We give them working capital, we give them technology, we give them markets, and then they engage between 1,000 to 3,000 farmers that they work with directly. We want to grow to 300 in Nigeria and then get that to 1,000 across 10 countries in Africa. Excellent. Markets is the best fertilizer from Deji, and you will be reaching how many farmers? So currently, half a million farmers, mm -hmm. so 500,000 farmers. Uh, we should get to 2 million in 3 to 2 million years. farmers it is. And with collaboration, we could be talking 30, 40, 50 million farmers. Excellent. Thank you very much. Let me come to you, Nkiru. Your one-minute pitch. What can you do differently to, you know, tap into this opportunity? Farming is like computer programming. Garbage in garbage out. You don't give farmers at the right time without technical support, then we're not going to improve their livelihood. For us, improve their livelihood, the put at the right time with technical support, then farmers will improve their livelihood. So <laughs> garbage in, garbage out means we are going to improve what we put in. So it's going to be quality in, quality information in, and quality outputs out, right? Excellent. Thank you very much. So, doctor, you've had the opportunities. You've had the challenges. You are in the midst of the crisis. What can we do differently? Please, Antonio, your one minute is now. Okay, um, for me, I still believe seed is basic. Um, seed is, is the foundation of everything. Uh, we just need to focus more on um, penetration, um, getting down to the community farmer. We need to build trust, you know, and um, when the right seeds are used with all the other complementary packages, I think there will be significant change in the industry. Thank you. Yeah, uh, plant breeders will always be plant breeders. Seed is everything. I totally, <laughs> I totally agree with you on that. All right, great. Winfred, my um, question back, 10x, what would that be? 
Well, I think, first of all, we need more processors like myself to be a bridge between the retailers and the farmers. You know, if we can continue to create innovative products uh, that are sustainable, that, it, that, are, that require sustainable practices, if we can continue to create products that reduce these post-harvest losses, create the products, create the demand, because some of the products we put to the market in the past years didn't exist, but people have come to love them. So we do need processors that are innovative, that have the ideas around converting some of these um, products into shelf-stable, loved uh, products that consumers will then buy. As consumers buy, you know, it, it, they begin to impress on the farmers to give them this, um, the kind of quality in terms of inputs that they need. So it's kind of push and pull, you know, we're pushing products into the shelves and we're pulling from farmers and requiring them to up their game in what they're doing. I think that uh, if we scale that, not just in the Bonita factory, but we have more innovative um, manufacturers thinking about how to utilize these inputs and then, you know, you start, flood the shops and the supermarkets and the open markets with that, then we can have a that, that 10x that you want. Wow, thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the fantastic panel. I don't even have time to take questions from our farmers in the room like I had promised, but as you have heard, the energy, the enthusiasm is ripe. The opportunity is in our midst and the commitment I had right from, you know, you know, uh, starting from the seed as the foundation to, you know, getting more processors and aggregators to meeting the farmers where they are, to starting with a problem in mind and solving for a particular solution to not from garbage in, but from quality in to quality out to the opportunity is now. I've had excellent ideas from the panel and I thank you very much for coming up front to share these solutions. Nigeria is ready to shape the future of Africa. Thank you very much. A round of applause for the amazing panelists and moderator as well. Beautiful, beautiful session, if you agree with me, really. All right, due to time constraint, we just have to move on to the next phase. As interesting and insightful as these discussions are in this room, we have not forgotten about uh, our participants who are engaging with us online by dropping their comments and contributions. All right. So in order to give a different but just as insightful perspective to the conversation on food and nutrition security in Nigeria, we will dive into the high-level dialogue to take a closer look at the looming food crisis. What have we learned? Yes. And uh, what are we doing to curtail this disaster? And what more can we do? This session will highlight learnings from other world regions in addressing food crisis, how uh, to ensure donor alignment and build for long-term sustainability given the challenge of climate change and other shocks. Well, I would like to invite the moderator of this session uh, in person of Ms. Ifeolua Oloronipa, yes, Partnerships Development Manager at Sahel Consultant up onto the stage. There she is. Please, another beautiful round of applause for her. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ifeolua Olorinipa, and I'm so honored and delighted to be the moderator for this interesting panel. Now, before I call on the esteemed panelists and also introduce the session, I'd like to stand on existing protocols. I'd like to recognize and appreciate the support and contribute, contributions from our partners and co-sponsors, AGRA, GIT, and the EU. We also recognize our online participants. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, the food crisis is not new to us. Today, we've said a lot on the issues. Even building on existing conversations from the UN Food System Summit last year to the recently concluded AGRF in Kigali last week, and even this morning, we have brought to the forefront the issues. And that we've established the problems and so now we're looking to focus on what have we learned, what are we currently doing, and how, what more can we do to curtail this disaster. Please join me as I welcome my esteemed panelists, 
Um, first, I'd like to invite Ms. Mariska Lamas, the first Secretary of Food Security and Climate, Netherlands Embassy in, in Nigeria. Thank you for joining us. I'd also like to call on Ms. Leila Bernamor Matthew, Head Human Development Delegation of the EU to the Federal Republic of Nigeria and ECOWAS. And I would also like to call on Ms. Aggie Konde, our last moderator, to join us on this panel. She's the Vice President of Program Innovation and Delivery at Agar. Thank you very much for joining us. Have we noticed that, have we noticed that interesting thing on this panel? Our executive chair at Sahel Consulting this morning just talked about how important it is to bring women to the forefront, and I'm very delighted and honored to be on this panel. Thank you so much. Now, just going straight into this um, conversation, we're talking about the looming food crisis. What have we learned? What are we doing to curtail this disaster? And more, what more can we do? Now, building on existing um, conversations to address the food crisis, um, I would just like to ask the first question, really, um, you know, how is your organization currently supporting uh, the agriculture sector in Nigeria across various thematic areas, whether production, policies, infrastructure, to really address the food crisis? Um, I'll start from Mariska, and I'd like to ask that, you know, you can just um, introduce your organization again so that we're all clear. Thank you very much. Go yeah. ahead. Thanks a lot, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So, my name is Mariska Lamas. I'm the first secretary of food security and climate at the Netherlands Embassy. Uh, and thanks a lot for inviting me uh, on this, um, how should we call it? A panel with all men is called a manal, so a panel <laughs> with all women is like a, a whammel. I don't know. Okay, so I think we'll go with, with the whammel for today. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, so, indeed, f from the from the Dutch Embassy, we uh, yeah we, we contribute to uh, to food and nutrition security uh, in Nigeria, um, and we do that in in, in several uh, ways. And I really liked also the uh, the panel before with uh, with all the private sector uh, uh, actors because yeah, that's also how we see it. So, private sector really plays a, a key role, um, and. As Dutch government, we focus on seed and horticulture because that's where we think we have the most uh, value to add. Uh, so we work, for instance, with uh, Sahel Consulting on our collaborative seed program. So you can also have a look at our uh, stand at the exhibition uh, outside where uh, together with uh, the Nigerian Agricultural uh, Seed Council and all different actors uh, in the seed sector, uh, we developed a, a national seed roadmap to look at where the sector is now, uh, what are the challenges uh, and what should be addressed uh, uh, in the coming five years. Uh, and that's really about multi-stakeholder uh, participation. So really bringing everybody around the table, agreeing on, on the vision, on the strategy and then working uh, together. Um, secondly, in uh, horticulture. Uh, that's our largest program, it's called Horti Nigeria, where uh, we work with uh, Wageningen University, uh, which is the largest agricultural university from the Netherlands, uh, and also with uh, IFDC uh, and, uh, and others, uh, East West Seeds Knowledge Transfer, uh, on transforming the horticulture sector here in Nigeria. Um, so we really try to be very targeted. I, I also liked uh, what other uh, speakers have said before. Um, we cannot solve all the problems, really uh, see where you have value to add uh, and then uh, focus on that. Um, and yeah, I think with regards to the, to the food crisis, uh, what we've done, for instance, in, uh, during the COVID-19 uh, crisis, we looked at ways to keep uh, the borders open, uh, to keep markets uh, working. So we did that together with, uh, with GAIN, which is also an important uh, partner of us. Um, and there's many other uh, interventions, but I think uh, I'll leave it at this for now. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Thank you so much. I think Okay. 
I think, um, you know, taking some key takeaways from what you just mentioned in terms of seeds, particularly starting from the foundation, you know, as we heard at the previous panel, and also really markets. This was also something that came strong from the, from the previous panel as well. Um, I'll come back to you, but I'd like um, us to go to Ms. Leila now, really discussing, um, you know, what, what currently is the EU doing in Nigeria across the thematic areas, um, if you could share some from that. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, well, well, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the EU is contributing in many different ways, of course, uh, to this issue. If you look at your title, you have crisis, you have food security, you have resilience in the title of the conference for today. Um, so the EU is um, really tackling the issue broadly. Uh, we have uh, multiple pronged prongs uh, approach to uh, the subject. Uh, I'll go quickly through things uh, and then we can revert uh, later maybe. So we have, well, you have a food crisis that is a humanitarian crisis in the Northeast already. So we do bring support uh, in terms of humanitarian aid to the Northeast. Uh, our, our ECHO, the uh, humanitarian um, organization of the EU is also looking into doing something in the Northwest. Um, we also uh, fund through grants many projects, uh, some of them on livelihoods, resilience, other on uh, agriculture and agribusiness, and I come back to that. Uh, so that's funding through grants. Uh, we also have a regional uh, effort that is uh, spearheaded by Brussels that also try to tackle the food crisis by providing uh, support to Africa and uh, in this case West Africa. So we are pri providing um, financial support to um, region regional reserve for food security that goes through ECOWAS, that's with, our, with the French, uh, French Development Bank, AFG. Uh, and then, of course, we also provide uh, financing to the sector. Uh, so you have different approaches, different actors. The uh, financing goes through uh, what we call the European Investment Bank. So they are looking into uh, bringing um, money to uh, agriculture as a business in Nigeria. Um, and they're always uh, they already uh, looking into implementing the uh, rural and uh, market tax. It's called RAMP. So they provide 150 million uh, loan, sovereign loan to government to build up on uh, rural roads and access to markets. So the um, in total, and of course, we also have, sorry, <laughs> what we call the Team Europe Initiatives. So it's uh, the commission that we represent together with uh, member states uh, are, have, are working together uh, in um, a Team Europe Initiative that is looking into uh, sustainable uh, business-minded agriculture and, parts and also renewable energies. The, uh, our strongest members apart from the uh, commission is, uh, in that is um, the Netherlands, Germany, France, and Denmark, Denmark. So they are contributing through various means. It's technical support. It's strong um, subventions, too, uh, de depending on the field. Uh, in total, the Commission and the European Investment Bank only are contributing 550 million to the sector, not counting humanitarian aid. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So two key things from that, you know, the support for humanitarian aid and also financing for agribusinesses. And I see, I definitely see a link with the first panel, you know, talking about where, what the innovative financing could be. And also now on this panel, talking about the support that's already existing in the system. So we'll come to you, we'll come back to you. Um, I just want to go to Aggie now to please just give us um, some introduction into what Agra is doing, particularly across various thematic areas really to, to, uh, to address the food crisis in Nigeria. Thank you very much. I think uh, we, we've switched roles, so I have to now uh, wear my hat as uh, the Vice President of uh, Program Innovation and Delivery at Agra. I'm honored to be here. Um, as you know, in, in Nigeria in particular, we have been uh, operating in two particular states, Kaduna and Niger. 
our motto is very simple as um, partners in the agriculture ecosystem we subscribe to the notion that we must be able to have inclusive agriculture and our definition of inclusive agriculture transformation is where women are participating youth are participating the environment is protected we're talking about people planet and profits so the last two years interestingly when they say never waste a crisis we have been testing out some models around what we are now calling sustainable farming. You know, uh, having of course noted that climate change is real and having noted that we must be able to feed ourselves because long value chains are really now a problem. So, you know, one part of the world goes to war and the whole world suffers. So really our role is um, as a not-for-profit institution how do we get into places where private sector is currently not finding profitable and places where government is too stretched to be able to concentrate in that area? So in the areas of agriculture, we focus all the way from the farm. So we talk about all inputs. So we have been supporting whether it is from training scientists to just have the knowledge to design the right varieties. You know, that's work we've been doing over the years going all the way to building capacities for small enterprises because we believe in grow local, uh, promote local. So we support local grantees. So well in Niger and in, the, in, and in Kaduna State, we've been working with over 300 to 400 grantees. So today, if you want to implement any program in agriculture, you've got a grantee who's able to take a grant, deploy it, be able to meet all your standards for whichever partner it is, and be able to deliver the result that you want. So that capacity is already live, in essence. The other things that we also do is to we work with partners. Agra is not in Nigeria directly. We've got a very small team uh, that you've been seeing. Please, my colleagues from Agra, if you're here, please stand up for recognition, that do all this work. But we do that from Sahel uh, partners to, yes, doctor uh, over there. Thank you. Uh, we do that with very many local partners. So they are the ones that do the implementation. So our job is to support in coordination, uh, learnings, transferring learnings from one country to another because we see different successes in Kenya, in Tanzania, in Rwanda, in Uganda, in Burkina Faso, Mali, and all those countries where we are. And we're saying we don't have time to be able to implement or go through this whole learning curve. How do we learn from others and be able to bring that here? So some of the quick things that we think all of us should challenge ourselves, we all have existing capacities. How do we collaborate with each other's capacities so we are not duplicating our efforts? So where we find capacity, we do not play that role. We work with an existing partner who has that capacity. We only go where there is a gap and where that gap is going to be catalytic in nature. So right now we are talking about planting. We have a dry planting season coming for Nigeria. What we need to be concerning ourselves now is how do we get the right information, the right inputs to farmers with the right market. If we did that now within the next 30, 60 days, we will not have the, the same hunger numbers we're seeing for Nigeria because we will have nipped the problem in the bud, as they say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Aggie. Um, so from the first round of questions, what I'm hearing is there a lot that's currently being done from funding to support for production, tech and capacity support, even climate action, and also ensuring inclusive agriculture in Nigeria. Um, now I'd like to start again from you as we go across um, the panelists. Um, given your engagements now in other countries, what are some key lessons that you've learned from your activities in other countries that we can leverage, some best practices that we can leverage in Nigeria as we look to address the food crisis? Thank you very much. I think the, the, the one quick thing we can do is really partnerships, like I mentioned. Um, earlier on, the panel was talking about the power of markets. Farmers are entrepreneurs. If today all our farmers were guaranteed a market and guaranteed a certain price point today, they would plant the right seed, they would plant in the right acreage, and they wouldn't interfere with the environment. So who are the people that have markets? 
we know of takers, we are looking at aggregators, we are looking at consumers, we are looking at institutional buyers. So whether it is schools, whether it's hospitals, whether it's corporates that have large people, this is where the market is. Whether it is, you know, hypermarkets or supermarkets, we need to be able to bring all these voices on the table to guarantee farmers a market. That is one. So partnerships are very critical and that will trigger or create the behavior that we would like to see. And then we start having what we call formal structured markets happening for farmers. That is one lesson that we have learned. And where structured market contracts have been respected, we have seen adoption of technology jump from 5 to 45% in one planting season. We've seen that happen. So the other lesson that I would like to bring to the table is the power of innovation, the power of digital. We all have access to data, but that data is in our personal servers or corporation servers. We don't have good quality public data that can give the private sector appetite to invest. Now, this is where the issue of getting our egos out of the way is important. Because if we indeed have a crisis, you cannot be sitting on data and you're not telling us where is excess production, where is underproduction, where is the market trending towards. So I, I would wish to ask, how can we collaborate better on quality data such that we are aggregating that data to be able to attract private capital into the system? Thank you. Thank you very much, Aggie. You know, two key things, the importance of partnerships and also um, data. And I think that's a question we can actually push to the room at the end of this um, panel to really understand the different stakeholders that are here. How do we collaborate to, to enable us share data, public data, and come together and use that to solve the problem? Thank you very much, Aggie. Um, but going back to you, Leila, what are some best practices or key lessons from your engagement that we, you know, what have, we, what have you learned and also best practices that we can leverage in Nigeria? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, we have been engaging, as I was saying, in many different ways. Um, what uh, we are currently building on uh, as related to agriculture now is, uh, uh, as she was saying, sorry, the uh, collaboration is key. Um, partnership is uh, now our middle name. And it's true that um, we need also to, um, to share data. And I think this, um, it's something that, is, that cuts across all fields in uh, the way we implement projects in Nigeria. It's not only agriculture. Um, now, the way what we have uh, taken out of the many projects we've been implementing in the past is that we have to build stronger link, work we always work together with government, maybe try to find new dynamic ways of working with government. Uh, in the particular field of agriculture, we are looking definitely, we've been doing resilience project in my team, for instance, but we're also now looking into uh, supporting agribusiness, uh, identifying the gaps, um, and the best practices really is, we are still at the stage where we need to have uh, to understand uh, the situation on the ground in a very detailed way. So if we could come up with a, a roadmap and uh, a, a very fine uh, uh, aggregated data, that would be one. Uh, and what we've learned from the past also is that when we don't have uh, good donors coordination, also with the private sector, with all actors, um, then very often uh, we miss the target. Thank you very much. I like the fact that you mentioned the need for a roadmap, you know. And then as I come to you, Mariska, one of the things I'm aware of, you know, that the, the Dutch uh, did was the National Seed Roadmap in, in collaboration with Sahel Consulting and really ensuring multi-stakeholder partnerships. Now, um, from that experience, what would you say are some key um, lessons that we can definitely leverage on, build on, that other donors maybe can also learn from in ensuring that we're all collaborating and working together? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think indeed it's, it's very important to, to have a roadmap 
and not just uh, like a policy document or a strategy which is quite abstract. As well as indeed you also mentioned in your presentation, there is a lot of strategies and policy documents uh, also based on the outcomes of the food system summit dialogues. Uh, but sometimes it's at a very high abstract level and in order to really move to implementation you need more practical uh, documents uh, and strategies and so what we did with the national seed roadmap is really to uh, bring everybody together identify uh, 22 topics in the seed sector in nigeria that need, need to be addressed identify which actors play a key role in tackling those issues uh, and then setting priorities and dividing tasks um, specifically who's going to do what so it's it talks about plant variety protection it talks about seed quality assurance it talks about uh, uh, extension services it talks about seed marketing and promotion uh, very specific topics uh, where Dutch uh, experts together with Nigerian experts work together uh, uh, to address it and we cannot do everything uh, so out of the 22 topics eight topics are now being addressed in the collaborative seed program uh, which still leaves a lot of other topics that uh, others can uh, step up and, and uh, address uh, one of the topics is also donor coordination uh, I have to say I have worked in Ghana for three years if I compare Ghana to Nigeria uh, especially with regard to donor coordination I think Nigeria can really uh, make some improvements um, even though Nigeria is not really a big uh, donor darling country uh, because of the middle income status but I think a lot of donors uh, here and I'm also of course looking at myself as a donor um, we, we do inform each other and I really want to compliment the EU eh, for taking a leading role in the Steam Europe initiative but I also would really like to appeal to the uh, to the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development to provide us with that guidance and tell us okay this is what we want from you uh, these these are the interventions you should be focusing on uh, if you're going to work in the dairy sector please work together with these and these donors because they are already doing the work uh, and i think that to have that kind of overview and more guidance uh, that would be really helpful uh, f for me as a, as a donor um, one other thing I want to mention eh, when you ask what are some of the, the lessons learned uh, from other countries and it was also mentioned before, uh, security is key to do, uh, to do anything. Uh, we are seeing some of the biggest Dutch companies uh, in Nigeria like Friesland Campina, I'm sure you all know Peak Milk for instance, like Heineken, like Unilever, telling us that after they've been here for decades sometimes, they are actually thinking of scaling down or maybe even uh, withdrawing because they cannot do their work. Uh, it is that that is the basic basics for everything. So I'm really hoping that the security situation will improve so that we can um, tackle yeah, the food crisis. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mariska. And with security, um, you know, we understand that this is a big challenge. And as part of this conference, we have a breakout session directly focused on safety and security, where we as stakeholders come together to provide actionable solutions or recommendations, action steps to ensure that we can also address that because, you know, that, that's a big part of agriculture in Nigeria. And I'm also happy you mentioned donor alignment. I think you, you may have been reading my mind because this is one of the questions I had um, to really understand how we as donors are aligning um, or are aligned with the needs from the landscape or the needs from the agriculture sector um, or institutional partners on the ground to ensure first that we are addressing the key needs um, and also to ensure that we're not working in silos or we're not duplicating efforts. Um, Aggie, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. No, thank you. Uh, so for those of you in the room that don't know how Aggress was started, really it was a call um, by the former UN uh, Kofi Annan, the led, which really was asking for African states to have an independent institution that can help on the coordination but prioritization of agriculture. So I, you know, this is something we work a lot on in every country in which we operate. And you know, we only get into a country once we are first and foremost get an endorsement from the country that agriculture is a priority, security must be a priority, 
and then there has to be a role for us to play. So coordination is one of the roles we have been playing in a very difficult space because I'm reminded by my president, Dr. Agnes Kalibata, that many times donors say they don't want to be coordinated. Now, the irony of that is that when you look at our last independent evaluation, it showed that unless all of the bottlenecks that the smallholder farmer faces are resolved for, they can never come out of a survival mode. So if Agra comes in and is looking at just two catalytic areas and then another donor comes and looks at another and another and, and all of them are not speaking to the same problem or layering on each other, we are really spending good dollar after bad. So as we know with the constraints in the economy with you know fewer dollars coming to development, I think the time is now. The time is now for us to coordinate ourselves more, not just donors, all actors in the agriculture sector. We must stop repeating what others have already done. If you listen to the innovations that have been tested and tried, they are the same. But is the needle moving? The needle cannot move until, as Didi says, we put our egos aside and get to work together. This is our continent, this is our Africa, these are our children, these are our mothers, our fathers, our grannies that are going home hungry. And within a few months, it's going to come to our own households in the city. It's because we're not going to afford food, right? So I think, like they say, never waste a good crisis. How do we want to move the needle on coordination? We, as Agra, have put our head in the, in the sun. We've said we are happy to play that difficult role of coordinating all actors against a common agenda. Because the beautiful thing is that all African states have what they call a national agriculture investment plan. So there is a plan. It's not that there are no plans. Where plans are not there, we support the development of those plans. There is a prioritization across all, from farm to folk. We are now talking about a food systems direction. Africa has already, like Nigeria, you already have a food systems roadmap. Nigeria is one of the four countries that has already done that. Kudos. So we would like to move those four countries and bring all the others along having a clear food systems roadmap and focus on the priorities one at a time. So that every dollar you invest, our own index is that for every one dollar we put in the agriculture sector, we want to give it a 40 to 50 percent return. And that can only be done with coordination. So happy to see how we can move the needle in that area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aggie. I think a major key takeaway from this panel, you know, the time is now. There's the need for coordinated action. We don't need to work in silos. We need to build on what we've already done in the landscape. We need to build on what other people are doing and really to address this issue. Um, so, you know, on this panel, we've talked about what we're currently doing as different funders, and we've talked about what we've learned based on our activities. Um, you know, we've, now we've, I like that we've started to talk about what more can we do um, in this in this landscape. So I'll go to you, Ms. Leila, to, um, you know, for your thoughts on what more can we do? What are some of the gaps that currently not be filled that we need to address? Yes, uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you. I think the gaps have already been uh, mostly identified, especially during the first panel. Um, we all know about the gaps. Uh, we have gaps in financing the, uh, the sector at all levels. And that's one of the issues the European Union is trying to address together with its member states at different levels. So you have microfinancing, you have uh, projects uh, going focusing on livelihoods and training people to get out of poverty and farmers. You have, uh, you know, uh, guarantees uh, provided to businesses, uh, SMEs, and uh, also big money maybe coming to the fast guarantee to big businesses. So all these levels have to be uh, addressed at the same time. So finance is definitely the weakest maybe, uh, you know, link in the in the whole chain of uh, the sector. Then um, um, it's um, maybe there is a lack, but uh, it's still, it's, we are doing it already, most actors and, and the private sector is doing it, but maybe there is still a lack in supporting the, uh, uh, the competitive uh, value chains, you know, the right value chains, let's say, where Nigeria has an edge, where Nigeria has a competitive advantage. 
Um, I was very happy to hear about the milk. Uh, it's something that I know we are going to be looking into uh, in the coming years. Uh, but um, that's also maybe one of the gaps that we can work on together, helping uh, government and uh, all the stakeholders, you know, to really list. Uh, um, we, of course, production. I think, it, if I remember well, that's one of the... Um, of the uh, agriculture is, uh, is on the agenda in Nigeria. It's an, a priority uh, for development in Nigeria. Uh, but we still, uh, there's still a gap in uh, competitive production. Production is not yet there. Um, innovation, how do we bring innovation? Uh, we are going to do projects in smart agriculture and things like that, but how do you scale up uh, together with the private sector, of course? And uh, still, uh, probably the supply and um, you know, uh, access to markets uh, for farmers. Things have been done in the past with donors, government, uh, private uh, sector, but maybe we should again come back to that point because uh, farmers if farmers cannot deliver the goods to markets quickly uh, and uh, there are also all the losses you know in the value in the, in the chain of uh, production you have lots of losses uh, harvest losses milk losses and all that so these are the main gaps our former pro i mean the projects we've been implementing in the past have taught us where were the gaps we've been addressing some of them and we're looking into addressing more of them but, uh, I mean, the emergency is now, and uh, the problem is how do we step it up, uh, step up our you know, activities. Thank you so much. And now, I'll just go to you, Mariska, you know, what are some, just answering um, the same question, really, these gaps that need to be addressed, really getting your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think there's there's so many gaps, uh, <laughs> so it's difficult to uh, to point one or two out. Uh, I think maybe what, just speaking on behalf of Dutch government, what with the gap that we are going to address is the issue of youth. Yeah. Uh, so it was also mentioned in the previous uh, panel. Um, Seventy percent of Nigerians are younger than thirty years. So there's a huge uh, population of young people that. Um, uh, is willing and eager, that has the energy, that has the innovative mindset uh, to make certain changes, uh, but maybe doesn't have the access to, to the right knowledge and tools, uh, finance, uh, in order to do that. Um, so one of the things we are developing now is a youth and agribusiness program together with IITA and Bob Inc where we're going to uh, look at training 10,000 young people between the ages of 18 and 35. Uh, on uh, agribusiness skills, uh, financial literacy trainings, how to set up a business, link them to mentor uh, uh, opportunities. Uh, and the idea is that yeah, those people uh, will really either start their own business, uh, so take an innovation and uh, make it into uh, a company, or that they would be employed by uh, by some of the, the bigger players. Uh, because And that's actually the same problem that we have in the Netherlands. A lot of young people don't see agriculture as uh, an, an interesting profession. And I think uh, in order to, uh, to have that uh, yeah, long-term uh, sustainability of the sector, you need to have more young people on board. Um, I, I, some, I read somewhere that the average age of a smallholder farmer in uh, sub-Saharan Africa is 55 years. Uh, yeah, that goes to, sh to show you that it's, yeah, we really have to look at young people uh, and not just uh, um, train them, but yeah, really help them to uh, uh, yeah, to set up a business or to, to be employed. Uh, and indeed, yeah, it was also mentioned in the previous panel, you can only do that if there is a business case. Um, so that's that's one of the gaps that we, we will be uh, addressing. Yeah. Thank you so much. I like that you touched on the subject of youth, um, because like you rently mentioned, this is clearly an opportunity that Nigeria can leverage, particularly in, in the agriculture sector. Um, so as we start to wrap up this panel, I would just like to go through um, from Aggie to you, know, to you, Mariska, really your closing charge, your closing remark as we wrap up, you know, what, what, what more can we do? How can we address the food crisis in Nigeria? Okay, thank you very much. I think my, my 
really reflection even from the morning panel and all the other you know conversations we've been in is um we've got the willpower for a fact everybody is ready to come into the you know playing field we all have different assets that we can bring to the playground and if we can learn from the covid pandemic what did we do with covid is we had a coordinating office everybody brought their best foot forward we had a target in terms of how do we get people vaccinated how do we social distance how do we what is the playbook for agriculture so we need to create a playbook that speaks to the planting season sub-saharan africa unfortunately is rain fed you know if we say we're going to mechanize today that's a long-term play we need medium term and long term play you know a playbook so we all have assets let's bring our assets to the table to our coordinating table let's prioritize countries that are going into a planting season because you miss one planting season you have a hungry country right let's get all the inputs the information i'm calling upon specifically media houses what are they talking about they've got 24 hours of airplay if we are not educating farmers on when to plant, what to plant, where to get the inputs, you know, showcasing the profit margins in particular value chains, showcasing the opportunities for young people, what content are we putting out every day, right? Then let us measure and account for each other. I think we, we should stop talking and just get into the doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aggie. Yes, well, I could not agree less. I mean... Uh, we are, the moment is now. Uh, many people are here. Uh, the stakeholders have more or less, I mean, agreed on many things. Um, and so we should be start doing. Um, I, 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 when I was speaking of a roadmap, well, you talk about playbook, but it's the same, really. We need to know what to do now. We need to have a clear plan on what's needed this year, this month, this year next year, in 10 years. Uh, so that's one, of course. And, um, and collaboration, I think, is always key. And, you know, we could just start by like, like this workshop that you're organizing today. That's one of the things we need to do more, uh, especially the part that comes after. Of course, the panels were good. <laughs> but, I mean, we need to uh, get hands on the, the, project, the problems and uh, work together. So I cannot say anything more, I think, except that we need to collaborate more. We need to coordinate more, and we need to start doing. That's, uh, <laughs> yes, I, I fully agree. Uh, let's get to work. Um, maybe one more uh, addition to that. Uh, I think a good thing out of this crisis, and that's worldwide, is that there's more political attention to food systems. Um, so. Uh, that's a blessing in disguise after the whole Ukraine uh, war. Now it's really high on the agenda uh, of heads of state, of ministers, etc. Um, so let's take that opportunity and let's also learn from other movements. Let's look at the climate change movement. Uh, that, that is, uh, people were able to agree at the highest level, at the head of state's level, on this is where we should go. We don't want to... The, the, our planet to warm up more than uh, two degrees. So that is our target. Uh, so I think as, as a food system community, if we can call it like that, if we would have a similar target, uh, high level vision, then it makes it easier to, to work together also here in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you've said it all, you know, we need coordinated action, we need to work now, we need to come together to the table with our different skills, identify how we can support and start doing. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of, round of applause to this very wonderful WAMO, that's what we're calling it. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think you just take a picture. Okay, um, so maybe we take, we have, we'll have our speakers also contribute to the questions. Um, maybe the first question, we have a microphone that we can pass around. 
Okay, I think the, the, the person behind. And please, if you could mention who your um, question is directed at so that we can also ensure that we're targeting the questions to the right people. All right, thank you very much. My name is Dr. Kelechuko Keze. Uh, my question is directed to all the panelists, all the discussants. One, I have to appreciate them for showing concern on issues of food insecurity in Africa, and especially in Nigeria. But I want to ask, the more efforts are put in place to address food crisis, the more we are having food crisis in Africa. What indigenous model have they either designed or uh, have thought about to address issues of food scarcity, realizing that agriculture impacts on the environment negatively. Realizing that uh, it also affects even the productivity because the soil nutrients are even uh, depleted as a result of this modern mechanized agriculture. Exposing the farmers to use of inorganic f uh, fertilizers. So what model that are indigenous they, can they profile so that when we go to the community, we begin to, you know, advocate that this is a better model that addresses issues of deforestation, issues of crop failures, issues of poverty, and not always relying on external driven ideologies and models that is not helping us here in our own context. What uh, local model? have they really come about in the course of their distance? Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I think we'll just take all the questions first and then um, for the sake of time, I would address them to specific panelists. I think it's afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Dayokusa, uh, a conflict transformation strategist, uh, gender expert, and former director, Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution, Abuja of the Department of Political Science in the 90s, Lagos State University. Two issues I want to address is climate change adaptation. And the second is the issue of the farmer had a crisis. And I want to put on the table the fact that I've discussed here this morning will come to naught if climate change adaptation is not on the front burner. I don't want to bore us, but let's put it on the table. The second is, I'm a valued member from inception of FAN, Forum, Forum on Farmer Harder Crisis. And we cannot move forward in this country on agriculture if we do not solve the Farmer Harder Crisis. I'm not saying this is a forum to solve it, but we're talking about collaboration. We're talking about innovation. Everything will come to naught if nothing comes from this forum to government about solving the farmer had a crisis. You've been in the field. Um, the more the merrier of thinking. We should all come together and think about the farmer had a crisis so that it does obliterate all the good effort in the different silos. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think we can take one more question. Can I Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Ganandru. My own is to Dr. Anthony that spoke on the breeding aspect. I think at this point in life, we should be talking of breeding for uh, ecological specific, specific. You breed for specific ecology because we should know very much that the soil is heterogeneous. And there are many factors that actually prove that even in Nigeria, things are not uh, uniform. Then number two, we should also be looking forward to produce a package. And that package is to back up 
any release variety. And this one should include the recommended rate of fertilizer, the herbicide rates to be applied, and there is need at interval to revalidate the soil nutrients because most of these varieties at time they are monocropping. We plant them as monocropping, are uh, absorbing and taking nutrients from the same zone and the same depth. Then at intervals, we need to revalidate if the nutrient is still there or otherwise. And that is the only way by which we can get up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have, okay, we have somebody with the microphone. Um, Go ahead, please. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Abdul Jalil Ibrahim. Um, like uh, what I wanted to rightly say, the missus actually started on that note. We are talking about food crisis in this conference. And I think it's uh, going to be good if we start on what is the issue on ground presently as regarding food crisis. Insecurity is number one. Regardless of a good yield, a good seed, we're talking about extension workers, not in large quantity or enough numbers to educate farmers. All these things cannot be effective if the farmers are still not secure to go to the farm and get whatever it is or implement whatever knowledge they have been given. So on this note, I just want to say, seems, it seems uh, no one is talking around that aspect. So leaving that aside, and let's talk about what has been discussed today. Um, I would rightly say, the, okay, their name, uh, Mr. Aminu, um, gave a wonderful presentation to me. He seems to understand everything as regards what the younger generation wants, what it takes to get people interested in having to work in a farm and all that. But there's a key note there. He said something. He said they are collaborating. His um, organization or company, he said, are collaborating with the CBN. So this brings me to my question. I think it's for you, Deji, to answer this or any relevant person. How are our farmers open to assess loans meant for them? How are they open to assess grants meant for them? We have something called the Bank of Agriculture in Nigeria. How do the local farmers down in the village assess these schemes? And they are there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think we have one person in the front. And There's we one would... behind here. Okay, so the man with the microphone and okay. then from the front and that's it. Thank okay. you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sugra from Ministry of Agriculture. And I would like to um, comment on several issues, really. One is um, the aspect that I think Mariska brought up about coordination. I've heard you and uh, will escalate that to the, to the Honorable Minister and Permanent Secretary for, for further discussion on that. Um, then about the youth in agriculture or how we bring them into the space to take up extension. You are much, I'm, I'm sure you're all aware that um, at some point this government tried under NPOWER to bring young people into extension space in the health sector and also in the agri sector. I was personally involved. Over 100,000 young people were trained. What is the private sector doing or other people that are you know, intervening in this space to link up with the, with the product of that particular program so that we can, because government cannot do it alone. Then we're talking about extension. Agriculture is on the concurrent list. I see here only people from, from federal level. How are we linking up with the subnationals? Nothing is going to happen. They own the land, they own the farmers. If we don't advocate for governors to give agriculture the needed um, uh, recognition and attention, it's not going to happen. We'll all be talking shop. We come, we eat the meat pie and everything and go away and nothing changes on ground. And uh, God help us with diabetes. So, really, we need to connect to the subnationals and not just the state, but what is happening at the local. Oh, am I seeing anybody from state? Excellent, excellent. 
Oh, local government, you're here. Fantastic. So we really need to work together. Like I said, government cannot do it. Federal government's money spreads too thin. If I say I'm concentrating only in Kaduna, Abia will say marginalization. Northeast will cry marginalization. But if the state governments are doing what they're supposed to do. So I think one of the key things we need to do is advocacy. Whoever is um, intervening in this, in this space, please make advocacy a key component of your in intervention. And then, um, then the, um, I think I've talked about donor coordination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Then there's a model they were talking about earlier. How do we get extension again? young people to participate, or how do we make extension last mile? Have we thought about the agro-dealer in the community? The little person that has uh, about two cartons of um, chemicals that he's selling, if we make him a focal point of where you add layers and layers upon, upon him in terms of knowledge, in terms of linkage, let him be a buyer huge companies that are buying things from the locality, let him be the one that will have the knowledge that when farmers come to buy products from him, he will tell them what to do. This is one of the models that we can, le we can use to actually have, to domesticate the extension work within the communities. And then we don't have to think of just public, but we are now going private. And the little man in the community is, and woman, by the way, I'm a gender, <laughs> whatever, woman, is is the one doing it in the community thank you very much thank you very much in the interest of time i think that we would um have to stop all comments now but i'm happy to announce that at the end of lunch we have breakout sessions focused on specific thematic areas that have been raised today security private primary production food processing where we as stakeholders can also sit and contribute to these solutions that we're asking ourselves about so this is a platform where you can contribute solutions action steps that we can that can be taken to address these issues. Thank you very much. Um, I'll hand over to the moderator now.